Welcome back to yet another episode. Today I want to talk about some of the horror films I've watched this October. Not all of them. I haven't watched nearly as many as I would have liked to. Uh, there was one there was one October that I was unemployed and I watched something like I think it was like 80 or a to 100 horror films in a month, which is crazy. Never again will I do that. But I haven't watched as many horror films as I would have liked to uh, up to this point, to be quite honest. I've been very busy. I've been working on some stuff for the channel and whatnot. I've been working a lot. So today I'm going to talk about five movies that I have seen this October and kind of go over what I felt about them. And what I've been trying to do this October is go... Um, watch things that I haven't seen before. So uh, usually uh, in October, I'm, I'm re-watching a lot of things that I love that, you know, really articulate the, the season for me. But in this case, I watched a lot of stuff that I hadn't seen. So I, I like to uh, keep it fresh, you know, October to October. I'm always trying different things. So let's jump right in. We've got the mummy who is going to be overseeing the proceedings here. He's got a very colorful pose. First up has like three or four different names. Um, Grey Knight, The Killing Box is another name for it. This is a Civil War horror-ish kind of film. Um, it's not... How do I say this? It's okay. It, it didn't really do much for me, I gotta be honest. The atmosphere is good. The cast is good. Um, it's got bunch of people. Corbin Burnson is great in this movie. It's got uh, Adrian Paul, is that? A Adrian Pastar from Near Dark. I got the two mixed up. Not Highlander, the Highlander guy. Adrian Pastar from uh, Near Dark, one of my favorite movies of all time. Billy Bob Thornton, uh, Ray Wise, Martin Sheen has a cameo here. So a really good cast they conjured up. And this film is directed by Hickenlooper, which is a funny name. <laughs> Uh, George Hickenlooper. It blends like African mythology and magic with the Civil War in a cool way, but it never really goes to the places that you think it's going to go. It never really delivers the message that you'd wish, wish it would have, um, even though it's trying to. It's got a lot of atmosphere and it follows uh, this group, uh, this platoon, this, uh, yeah, this group of, of Union soldiers led, sort of led by a captured Confederate who is leading them into this area to find this lost platoon, essentially. The supernatural elements come in with this undead squad of of people, of Union soldiers. I, no, actually it was Confederate soldiers that were killed. Or actually, I think it's just soldiers in general. Um, Confederate and Union who form this, this amorphous cloud of undead sort of Civil War um, people who fell during, during the battles, soldiers. And so it sounds cool, like a lot of cool ideas, but it just doesn't deliver. The, the filmmaking's fine. Um, there are some legitimately creepy scenes, and I love the supernatural stuff. There's just not really enough of it. But it's cool to see a Civil War horror film. I gave this film a 2.5 out of 5. Upon thinking about it, it leans closer to a 3 out of 5. I, it just didn't compel me. It didn't move me too much. But that is The the Grey Knight, again, which just got a Blu-ray release, I think, or announced at least. It's also known by a bunch of different names. The Killing Box is another name for it. I don't know. It's an okay film. It's unique. It's a Civil War horror film, which we don't have many of. You could probably count them on your one hand. Maybe this is the only one. I'm not exactly sure. Do you guys know any other uh, Civil War horror films? I know there are like Outpost, World War II stuff, a lot of that stuff, but not much Civil War, which was one of the, you know, all wars are horrific, but, you know, we were killing ourselves. So I felt like the film could have said a lot more about what we were doing. And of course, that platoon of both Confederate and Union undead soldiers is a commentary on what we were doing to each other um, for, for specific reasons. Either way, that is The Killing Box, also known as Grey Knight. Not a bad film. Two and a half out of five. 2.7 out of five. We'll give it. It was all right. Next up, we have a Larry Fassenden film called Wendigo. A Wendigo is a Native American spirit entity that is a shape-shifting spirit. Uh, could take the form of many things and many things at once. Um, so... It delves into Larry Fassenden. I've only seen The Last Winter and this. And Larry Fassenden obviously has something to say about uh, what we're doing to our environment, what we're doing to the land, um, pollution. You know, in The Last Winter, it's about fossil fuels, which are, you know, essentially um, the minerals from age-old creatures of this planet, ancient creatures. 
And that fossil fuel sort of comes back and wreaks uh, revenge uh, on these um, on these this team that's up in the Antarctic, I think. It's been a long time, so forgive me for the details there. Wendigo, however, is about a, a family, a father, played by the guy from Dawn of the Dead, uh, maybe his name's on here, Jake Weber, uh, and Patricia Clarkson as his wife, and then a young boy, who you've seen before. They all do a great job. It's a character piece, really, and it, it really, what this film does so well is make you really care about this family. Stuff really doesn't start happening for like 45, 50 minutes in. It's a slow burn of a film, but right in the very beginning, they hit a deer, which is a, a very clear sign of what, you know, what, <laughs> what humans impact on the planet is. And this deer was actually being hunted by a group of like uh, redneck hunters. This, this film takes place upstate New York. And of course, one of the, one of the main hunter guys blames Jake Weber's character, the father, for killing the deer. He was like, that was my deer, you know, what? you have to pay me for it. And, J and, and the father's like, no, like, are you out of your mind? And then this guy starts sort of stalking them in a in a very creepy sort of way he's doing certain things that uh subtle things that the family doesn't notice at first like watching them have sex and and uh shooting like bullets into their home when they're not when they're not there and just a lot of like weird little things like that and as the story goes on um this this wendigo entity sort of comes into play more and more and I don't want to say too much without spoiling it, but I like, up to this point, everything about the film I, I love. I love the atmosphere. I love the isolation. It feels like The Shining in a lot of ways. And um, you know something bad is coming. Now, the bad things do happen, but they're not as impactful as I wished they would be. Also, the creature is shown way too much. Fessenden does a lot of cool stuff with editing and with the camera. A lot of weird effects, a lot of weird stop motion uh, filters, uh, like just filters all over the place. Just really unique camera work, which I commend. I love when people do cool things with the camera, move the camera, do interesting effects. I love that. Fisenda does that great. But what he doesn't do too great is light and shoot the Wendigo monster. It's goofy. There are a couple scenes that are effective when it's not shown very close up, but there are too many shots of it close up with this stupid deer head and a man's body and like tree antlers and it's a cool idea but the design doesn't work it actually reminds me of the prophecy or prophecy from um 70s 79 the frankenheimer film with which i love to death but it has a very goofy monster that frankenheimer just admitted like he just didn't know how to shoot it didn't know how to light it Fessenden didn't know how to light his creature here and he did it wrong and he showed it way too much and it really it really ruins the last act of this film which could have been very powerful and has a lot of powerful ideas and cool supernatural ideas it just doesn't stick the landing because the creature is shown too much that could make a make or break a monster movie for me i didn't know this was going to be that in the third act like a monster movie kind of thing but it kind of falls into that and it shouldn't have because this is more of an atmospheric moody character piece i liked a lot of its themes and what it was trying to say but but that third act really left me feeling you know, when you're when you're really frightened throughout the entire film and you're feeling for these characters, the isolation and everything, and then all of a sudden you're laughing because the character design, because the creature looks so goofy, you know something is wrong. I, you know, it's just like, oh, come on, really? There's one great shot of the creature running through the woods, well lit, and it's just sort of running, and it's wide shot. And it's far, it's far enough away that you can't <laughs> real, you don't realize how goofy the creature is. But Vicendin still does a good job with this movie it's a solid three out of five i enjoy this one glad to have it in the collection and i want to watch more facendon's work like habit that's the big one the vampire film i love his independent unique style he is not mainstream in any way he 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 is on his own path and i i love that he's still making films to this day i need to catch up with his work i admire him facendon is more of a character actor you know him as a character actor if you saw his face you'd know him he pops up in tons of horror movies but he's actually a really talented writer and director that is wendigo next up we have the belco experiment now going into this i was hoping i would enjoy this more than mayhem which is an office satire horror film um, more of an action horror film in terms of Mayhem, Joe Lynch, which I'm not a big fan of. I, I just, I love Samara Weaving, but I couldn't really get into that movie, despite 
the malcontent I feel for those types of jobs. I've been there, I've done that, I have stories of my own that explore the malcontent of the office environment and the soul draining aspects of many jobs that we that we do for the better for the of society, the betterment of society, we're told, right? So the rebel in me loves these ideas. Belco experiment gets it right. I really, really liked the Belco experiment, bordering on loved. What's really impressive about the Belko experiment is the characterization. There are tons of characters here. 80 of them get trapped in this building and a social experiment is run on them. They don't know who's running the social experiment. They don't know what's going on. They think it's a joke until they realize that it, it is not a joke. Uh, this voice comes over the intercom and says, you have to kill two of your fellow employees or we will kill 20 of you. Um, I'm throwing out arbitrary numbers because I don't remember the exact ones in 30 minutes. If you don't kill two of your fellow employees and they're like, ha, yeah, it's a joke. You know, you have every aspect of society is represented here. And it's a really good microcosm of how society rips itself apart because of human nature, because everybody's a little bit different. Certain people want power. Certain people want to protect themselves. Certain people care more about themselves than others. Certain people are crazy conspiracy uh, theorists, which we have represented here. We have the blue collar grunts represented here. We have all aspects of society represented here in a very diverse way. And I love that about the Belko experiment. The Belko experiment's written, produced, and uh, pushed, really, by James Gunn. This was his blank check film after Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, when you make a big movie, the studios are usually like, here you go, make any movie that you want. This is a movie he wanted to make. He's also got tons of sequels, he says, uh, planned out, which we might not ever get because I don't think this film did very well. But this is a film that very seldom makes it into the mainstream. It's bloody, it's gory, it's brutal. I mean, this is one of the more bloody films I've seen in the last five years. I gotta be honest. I loved the gore in this film. The The effects are fantastic, vibrant. Um, you know, you have this sterile office environment like a doctor's office. You know, I always hate how sterile and lacking, col lacking of color these environments are. And James Gunn juxtaposes the bright, vibrant, technicolor blood against these, these very... Um, just drab office environments. Excellent stuff in terms of gore. You have your characters that that uh, are trying to take the power. You know, they're worried about their family more than they're worried about their fellow man, which is understandable. That's the thing. All of these characters, you understand where they're coming from. And that's not easy to accomplish with a dozen or so characters that you really feel like you know. Um, and, and it's very impressive. Tony Goldwyn is fantastic in this. If you want to say that if there's an antagonist, he would be the antagonist, but you resonate with him. You feel for him. He wants to obey this voice, the commands of this voice, because he's worried about his family, you know, and I, I get that, but he's willing to kill many, many people to protect himself and his family. My family needs me, he says. And it really resonates. You know, I got goosebumps thinking about it. My hair's standing up. Uh, the main character here is really good, though. He, uh, John Gallagher Jr., who I've seen in a few other things, he's sort of your... You know, he's a, he's got a great arc. Him and his girlfriend have great arcs because they're pe they're not bad people. And um, Tony Goldwyn is sort of like, we have to obey the, the voice. We have to kill We have to kill so that less are killed. And, and um, John Gallagher's character is sort of like, no... Killing is never the answer, which is, you know, which is something that's a moral dilemma that we all struggle with and we all think about and philosophers have been struggling with for so long. And, and this film really gets these philosophical ideas out in a microcosmic sort of way very, very well. And I commend it for that. Great performances across the board. Michael Rooker pops up in here. A lot of character actors you will, you will recognize. The Belko experiment gets the office malcontent satire right very right and i would love to see a sequel because god it sets up for a sequel so well great ending sticks the landing love the belco experiment great production value directed by greg mclean by the way so gun hired mclean to direct this and god he does a remarkable job mclean you would know from mm, god the australian outback movie that i'm drawing a blank on oh my goodness i might be able to see it from here wolf creek <laughs> wolf creek uh he directed and he directed a couple other horror films as well but this is my favorite not a big fan of wolf creek but god he nails belco experiment great movie i love it probably one of the my favorite that i've seen 
this year. I, I really thought they nailed this one. James Gunn did excellent. You don't see mainstream big budget movies like this often. Hell yeah. Belko Experiment. Love this one. Can't feel my legs. Next up, we have a movie that I was convinced I was going to love. I, uh, I overhyped it. I figured with a movie with this concept, how could they, how could they f*** it up? How could they go wrong? Well, they kind of went wrong. It's not the worst movie I've ever seen, but it's not very good. That is Monster Brawl. With a name like that, I'm interested. Now, the conceit is very cool. This is done in the style of a WWE pay-per-view event, okay? So you have eight monsters squaring off two by two until there's a victor. Actually, you have a lightweight division. They only fight once, and then you have, like, the heavyweights, which we see um, sort of a, um, a tournament kind of thing with, with those four monsters. Now, this film's got all the, all the tenets of, or all the aspects, I should say, of a WWE event. It's got the announcers, the colorful announcers, which are great, played by Art Hindle from The Brood, who's fantastic, and, uh, and Dave Foley, who is always good to see. So they're hilarious, they're fun, they're one of the best aspects of this film, believe it or not. The other great aspect is, yeah, we do get to see monsters brawl in a very uh, wrestling sort of fashion. It's funny, it's, it's, the, the, it's shot well enough, it looks good, it's goofy, it knows what it is. My main issues with the film is 45 minutes in, you've seen everything the film has to offer. It's redundant, it's formulaic, and it runs out of steam after the first 45-50 minutes. Um, we get to about five minutes of each character's backstory and how they're invited to this event in the swamp. And those are cool because they all have a different sort of atmosphere. We see where they all came from. You have uh, the Cyclops, which is an odd choice uh, from Greek mythology. You have Witch Bitch, which is a witch from Salem. You have uh, the Swamp Creature, who's like overweight and kind of funny. You have Frankenstein, Werewolf. You have the Mummy. You have Zombie Man. You have... I, am I I'm blanking on one of them here? Uh... Lady Vampire. These fights are fun. They're, they're a little lazy. There's so much you could have done with things like the mummy, like his raps. And my buddy John was saying the, the video game Darkstalker. They should have played the video game Darkstalker and got some ideas for some moves that they could have done because it would have been cool for them to utilize what makes them the monster that they are. And they're just, they do more so just do wrestling moves, you know? And there's some, the, the, the deaths are similar in some ways. And it's just, it's just kind of, it's not very creative in terms of what the monsters do in terms of the fights. There is a callback to uh, Mike Tyson's punch out where they're one of the the, the swamp monster, I think. Um, you got to hit him in the gut. And Art Hindle goes, you, I haven't seen that move since uh, King Hippo from in 1988, which is a call, which is a, a reference to Mike Tyson's punch out on the Nintendo, which as a Nintendo fan, I grew up playing that game in the early 90s. So as a Nintendo fan, that was a nice little nod. But uh, little things like that, you know, keep your interest, little references to movies, things like that. I, it was okay. Um, you have Jimmy Hart from the, the from from old wrestling days in here. It gets really annoying very quickly. You've got Robert Malay, who's apparently a, a wrestler. Kevin Nash is one that I grew up watching. You have a UFC kind of referee. Uh, and, uh, I don't know. It's okay. It's like a two. It's like a two, two and a half maybe on a good day. But it's just too formulaic, and it just... It just goes on and on, and you're just like, okay, I got it, I get it, I, I understand, I, yeah. It needed some sort of a plot thread. That's what it needed. Like a character, maybe the referee, they could have picked like a, a dorky little referee that sort of tied everything together or something. I don't know. So many, there's so many routes they could have gone with this film that I could think of right off the spot that I just wish they did, but they didn't. It's, it's a cool conceit, not a very good movie. Monster Brawl, it'll stay in the collection because it's fun maybe to put on when... You have a party or something, and you don't have to pay too much attention to the movie. It's just playing in the background. So, it's all right. Monster Brawl. And last but not least, we have a Lucio Fil Fulci film I cracked into called Enigma. This is such a weird film. Not all of Fulci's films are weird. This is one of the not as weird films, maybe, but it's still super strange. So, starts up with this, this girl who's picked on in this all-girls school, and um, everybody in, in the school sort of... Um, plays a big giant prank on her that lands her in the hospital actually it's it's incredibly cruel and what ends up happening this girl goes into a coma and she invades the body of this new girl who comes into this school and sort of possesses her from her hospital bed so she's in a coma but she somehow possesses this new girl 
And so, great idea, great conceit, very weird. This film has some bizarre scenes, like a scene where a woman is, cons like, consumed by snails, which, again, I don't like animals being used in film. Hopefully they weren't hurt. I'm sure they were. So that, that scene was kind of hard for me to watch, but it's really goopy and, and sticky and, and very strange and surreal. And you know Fulci, he lingers on this stuff over, and he just lingers on it, lets it seep in, and lets it affect you. Um, so I wasn't a big fan of, of the animal usage there, of course, but you have some really cool deaths. You have one, uh, where this statue comes to life and kills this girl. You, you, you know, it's a slasher. It's a giallo mixed with uh, a possession story inspired by the exorcist, maybe a little bit, but it's, it's unique enough to stand on its own. And I'm so glad to own this in the collection, Enigma. And it's, it's not one of my favorite Fulci films, but it's still a solid three. I, I love all the characters. I love the lead actor. She's great. Um, even even the, the lead male. There are a lot of characters that are juggled in this film. Um, and they're all fun. And it, it's, a, it's a good film with a lot of atmosphere. And it's very distinct in its atmosphere. And I love Fulci. I love all of his work. It's not one of my favorites, but I still really enjoy it. And I'm so glad to own this Severin release here, which is just incredible right i got this um during their half off sale this wasn't half off but this was one of their exclusives and um it's got tons of stuff it's got a poster you know liner notes here it, it's got a ton of cool stuff so i i'm so glad and a soundtrack cd as well so glad to own this i'm glad i got to check this out this month again not one of my favorites oh i just realized there's a titty on the front so i'm gonna have to <sighs> I just want to thank you all for checking out this video of what I've been watching this October, kind of catching you guys up on some of the things that I have watched. I ch I've showed a lot of a lot of these off and talked about them a bit on my Instagram, instagram.com slash theboardcyborg. Shout it out when I can, because I do post uh, the stuff that I'm watching um, definitely in October on a nightly basis. I try to post what I'm watching and then the next day sort of follow up because people ask how I thought about it and sort of give a mini review. So I thought I'd come in here today and talk about five movies uh, that sort of stand out. Um, not great. I haven't had too much of a great track record, but the cool thing is I'm going outside of my comfort zone. Civil War horror movies and, uh, you know, new ones. Mel Belko Experiment that I haven't seen. Larry Fassenden. You know, movies that, that I've been neglecting for a long time that I, I wanted to finally give a world to. So, you know, I really, I really had, I have had fun up to this point in October. I plan to amp it up a little bit, start watching some of the classics, maybe some of the classics that I've yet to see. Of course, I've watched a bunch of Universal stuff over and over. I always watch Universal stuff. It's always sort of my, uh, my calm down movie before I start reading, before I go to bed. I, I love the Universal stuff, so I have watched a bunch of those over Dracula, Dracula's Daughter, the Spanish Dracula I've watched up to this point. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd love to know what you thought about these movies if you've seen them. Feel free to leave that down in the comments below and we'll get a little discussion. Do a barrel roll. Rolling. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel and want to see more videos like it, go ahead and hit the subscribe button as well as the little bell for notifications. I also have a Patreon and some t-shirts, so feel free to check out those links in the description below. I appreciate any support in that realm. Anyway, guys, I will see you all next time. Board Cyborg is out. Uh...